Join us for the Living the Life broadcast on our series, Understanding the Goodness of God, with Dr. Chooks Ugohe. The message is titled, The Goodness of God Makes Me Set My Face Like a Flint. The goodness of God makes me set my face like a flint. There's something when the more I understand the goodness of God, the more resolute, the more resolute I become. In the things that I, 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 I am lodging for, the things that I am pressing to, I become very resolute about them. Look at this scripture in Isaiah chapter 50. That's where we start in this morning. Spirit of God, help me to preach your word and, and share the thoughts that you put in my heart that your people might be blessed this morning in the name of Jesus. Thank you for utterance in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. There's something about... Let me finish it. Let me finish the scripture. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. There's something about... Knowing that God will help you. There's something about knowing that God is on your side. There's something about knowing that God is with you and God is coming to your aid. To, to know that God will help you is to know that he is good towards you. Is to know that he is, he cares about you and he loves you, and he is on your side uh, uh, being, being very willing to commit his resources, his person, everything that he is, holding back nothing, and putting them all at your disposal to get you to wherever it is that you need that help to get to. Do you know that in the Garden of Eden, when the enemy came to, to, to the woman, Eve, and suggested to her that God was hiding something away from them, that God was keeping something away from them. And what it was, she, she was trying to convince Eve right there, and she succeeded, was that God is not going to help you. God is not going to help you. God is keeping something away from you. God is not for you. God is sinister. God is not good. God is not, you know, he's not on your side. So you need to sort yourself out. Basically, that's what the lie was about. You need to sort yourself out. God is not helping you. God is not coming through for you. God is not, is not there for you. He is there for himself. He has an agenda that is opposite to you. It's not in your interest. In fact, it is in your interest to disobey him and eat this fruit because he's not helping you. In other words, the truth of Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7 was not believed by Eve. And when Eve shared the idea of eating the fruit but with Adam, Adam believed it. Adam believed that God is not helping them. God is not on their side. God is not supporting them. God is keeping something away. God is opposed to them. God is sinister to them. God is not good. And they believed it. And like I've explained in previous uh, uh, Sundays uh, before now, the moment they believed that lie, a stain, a stain came on their spirit. Death came in. And then on their mind, a stain came on it. That stain is called unbelief. That stain is called unbelief. They, don't, they didn't believe anymore that God is good. And, and so... If you look at this verse that we're looking, it says, Therefore, I will not be disgraced because I have believed that God is helping me. Amen. Somebody say, God is helping me. Is helping or somebody say, God is helping me. Is helping so to believe that God is helping you is to believe that God is good. Is to believe that God is good. So when you don't believe that he is good, what, one of the things that you see in your life is your struggles, your struggle to accept that he will come through for you. 
your struggle to accept that this thing will happen the way you desired it. Your struggle to accept that it will not end the way the devil wants it to end. So, so, so we all we are born with a struggle because of that stain we received from our forefather Adam. We received a stain in our, in our consciousness. So we all we are born doubting God. We all we are born struggling to believe him. Struggling to accept that he will help us. Struggling to accept that he will help us by healing our bodies when we are sick. Struggling to accept that he will provide. Struggling to accept that he will defend us. That's why we get afraid. Struggling to believe that he is there to make a way where there seems to be no way. Because there is that stain that came from Adam. But here, the, 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 the prophet Isaiah is telling us, because he has believed in the goodness of God, he is so sure that he will not be disgraced. Somebody say, I will not be disgraced. Because God will help me. So knowing that I will not be disgraced, knowing that God is good towards me, knowing that his disposition towards me is that of kindness at all times, that his disposition towards me is that of love at all times. Therefore, I set my face as a flint. Knowing, having that background understanding that his goodness is backing me up, that because I have believed that I will see his goodness, I do not lose heart. I do not faint. Because I know he is good towards me, I set my face as a flint. And I explained to us that the flint, the metaphor being used here, the flint is a stone. It's a very hard stone. And when the flint is, is set in a direction, it doesn't bend. It's very hard, very stiff. So when you say, I set my face like a flint, it means I am resolute. I am resolute in my conviction about what I am believing. And because I've set my face as a fling, I know that I will not be ashamed. I know that disgrace will not come. I know that God will come through for me. Somebody say, I know God will come through for me. Or oh, somebody say, I know God will come through for me. Oh, amen. And, and you see, this is the struggle of all humans to believe that God will come through that you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And, and what it is, God is wanting all of his children to come to this place where you set your face like a flint on the promises of God and you do not stagger, you do not waver, you do not shake, you set it. I know that money will come through. I know that child will do well. I know, somebody, hallelujah. I know that I will be healed. I know that the dream will come through. I know that the business will prosper. I know. That's what it means when you set your face as a flint. It doesn't matter what the enemy is throwing at you. It doesn't matter what the evidences are suggesting. I have set my face as a flint. Somebody say I have set my face as a flint. I, it doesn't matter what the evidences are saying. It looks like it's not working. I have set my face as a flint. It looks like it's being attacked. I have set my face like a flint. I know that I will not be put to shame. So we struggle to set our faces because we struggle to believe that he will help us. That's why we are not resolute. Because we struggle to believe that he will come through. We struggle to believe that his resources will aid us and will back us up. His mercy will overflow towards us. His compassion and kindness will come through. We struggle. So we are not resolute. We, 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 we waver, we stagger. So the opposite of setting your face as a flint is to stagger, is to waver, is to vacillate. Today you believe, tomorrow you don't. Today in the morning you are believing. Then, you know, by in the afternoon some evidences show up. Then you begin to wonder, is it going to come through or is it not going to come through? Then you try to believe again. Then, then you see more evidences. Then you stagger. <laughs> like the children of Israel, you know, when, 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 when they were in Egypt and they had gotten tired of the oppression of, of the Egyptians. And they were crying out to God and God heard them. 
And God sent Moses to them. And God sent Moses with a message, I have come down to deliver you. Moses came to the people and said, I met with God or God met with me. And he told me to go and tell Pharaoh, it's time to let these people go, to let my people go. The people say, huh? Moses said, yes, God sent me. They say, show us a sign that God sent you. And then Moses performed the signs that God told him. He, he, God told him to, to throw the stick on the ground and it would become a snake. And he did so. And he became a snake in front of the people. And then the people ran away. And then he pulled the snake from, from, the, 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 from the tail and it became a rod back in his hands. He put his hands in his, in his bosom. It came out white. And then he puts it back. It became healed. Then people say, ah, okay, okay, okay. We see the sign. We see the sign. Okay, you can go to Pharaoh. Then he goes to Pharaoh and announces to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, who are you? Who is your God that I should listen to him? Nonsense. Nonsense. It's because these people don't have work. That's why you're coming to be talking to me like this. I'm saying you want to, you want to go for what? Which holiday? To worship which God? I don't know that God. I don't recognize him. Mostly, Pharaoh says, it's because these people are idle. That's why you have time to come in to be asking for this kind of leave. Nonsense to you. He called his men. He said, make the work harder for them. Nonsense. It's because they are not busy. That's why they are coming. And then when the time they came back, <laughs> the next day, the work had become harder. Isn't it interesting when you start believing God for something that it becomes worse? The work became harder. And the people were now crying under the weight and the burden. And then they said to Moses, huh? Huh? Didn't you say you came to deliver us? You've made things even more difficult for us. You've made things more difficult for us. No, no, no. We don't want to go again. No, no. We... Can you see? Yesterday they said we are ready to go. Today, ah, we don't want to go. <laughs> Moses says, why are you people talking like this? God, I met with God. God said we will go. And we confront Pharaoh. So Moses goes back to Pharaoh. And says to Pharaoh, let the people go. Pharaoh says nonsense. And then, you know, they start a show of power. And we, we read of the ten plagues. Each one of those ten plagues targeted a god of the Egyptians. And every time that there was a confrontation, the people would, when people see the, the judgment on the, on the gods of the Egyptians and the miracles that God performed through the hands of they'll believe. Let's go, let's go. And then the Egyptians will counter it. They, they, they back down. They were staggering. They didn't set their face as a flint regarding the promise of God. And they kept on staggering. Until finally, on the last day, on the day of, of, uh, of Passover, God had dealt with all of the gods of Egypt. And on that night, Pharaoh's firstborn son was slain. And together with the firstborn of all the Egyptians, and then Pharaoh finally agreed. Your God is God. In fact, Pharaoh told Moses, pray for me. Pray for me. I have never seen this kind of thing before. And then Moses took the people and they left. And one would have thought that after they had seen these ten miracles, despite their staggering, despite their, their wavering, that they would have believed that God was helping them. But no, they get to the Red Sea. And as they come by the Red Sea, uh, there's water in front of them. They cannot go. And then they hear that Pharaoh is behind and they look and it's true. In, immediately they see Pharaoh coming from afar, like very, very far. They began to shout again. They said to Moses, we said it. We said it. Leave us in Egypt. It was better we died there than to come and die here. You should have left us there. Can you see? This, they have left Egypt. They are now at the brink of the Red Sea. But situations and circumstances has changed. Pharaoh is on their tail. Now they don't want to go forward anymore. So we see the children of Israel never ever set their face as a flint. They didn't believe that God was helping them. Despite the fact that they were seeing the help of God. They have seen the miracles of God. Water. Water turned to blood. They saw hail come from heaven. They saw all kinds of miracles. In the last one, 
they saw all the firstborn of Egypt, including animals. They all died. And yet, they struggled to believe. They struggled to believe. So, so what happens when people struggle to believe? They stagger. Hallelujah. This morning, I want to, we want to deal with this issue of staggering. Because this is what is keeping many of us from accessing and manifesting the goodness of God. Staggering. Please put on that video for me. There's a video that I have. I want to show you. Please put it on. All right. <laughs> okay. No, one more time. One more time. I, I want you to notice this guy is intentional about going forward. But there's something that is working inside of his head that is not allowing him to move forward. This is staggering. This is staggering. Many believers are in the place where this man is. It's fine. Many believers are in this place of not making progress, of staggering. Look in your Bible with me to Romans chapter 4. We came to deal with this issue of staggering today. Amen. Romans chapter 4. Let's read at verse 17. Did you notice that when people are staggering, they actually do not make progress? There's no progress. They end up falling. They end up crashing on the ground. And they don't make progress because they stagger. Look at, I want the old King James Version. Romans chapter 4. I'm going to read from the New King James, but I want to read it from the old King James, verse 20. So if anybody's got the old King James, I, I, need, I, need, I need it up. Okay, let's read at verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver. The old King James says he did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that he had promised, that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. I'm going to stop there. All right. Let's, let's talk about this issue of staggering this morning. To stagger means to be inconsistent. To stagger means to what? To be inconsistent, to waver. The Bible said concerning Abraham that he staggered not at the promise of God. He staggered not at the promise of God. I, I began to question this issue of staggering in the course of the week as the Lord put this in my heart to share today. So in my usual way, I tried to investigate this whole thing about staggering. The, what is the physiology? What's going on in the head or in the brain of a person that staggers? So I called a few of my doctor friends to ask them questions. With that video of that man who is staggering, 
What's really going on in his head? Why is he staggering? One of my friends explained to me that you could stagger because if, for instance, you are given a load, a weight that your muscles cannot carry, and you lift this weight, and the weight is bigger than your muscles, you stagger. You stagger. And the staggering is your body telling you to drop that thing, otherwise it destroys you. So, so the stagger is for you to release the weight and drop it off. And I, I actually saw some weightlifters, you know, weightlifting the sport. When a weightlifter carries something that is beyond the strength of his muscles, and he just jacks it and lifts it, he staggers and staggers, and then he has to drop it. And they are training, you know, they are trained in such a way that you can drop it without hurting yourself. Because if you don't drop it where well, that thing can fall on you and, and hurt you very badly. So when we can't carry a weight, we stagger. So concerning uh, um, Abraham, the reason Bible says he staggered not. So there was stuff that was heavy. The promise of God was heavy. But he staggered not. So let's talk about Abraham, what was going on. We don't know exactly at what time in his history that God promised him um, that he was going to have a son. All we know is that at age 75, God tells him to leave his father's land and go to a, a, a new place that he was going to show him, and he was going to make him a great nation. It's possible that that, that word had been with him for a little while before age 75 when he obeyed it. We don't know. The other thing we don't know is how long he's been married. We don't know. But we know that in Genesis chapter 11, when he began that journey, that he was already married. So we don't know. We know he was 75. His wife was 65. We don't know how long they've been married. It's possible they got married maybe in their early 20s. We don't know. But they've been married. So they started that journey as a couple. With no child. In fact, when that journey started, Abraham's father was part of the journey. Until, you know, Abraham's father had to die. And they, they packed and stayed in Haran. And then, you know, after some time, God says, it's time, let's go. And they continued the journey. And then we see the promise clearly in Genesis chapter 12. God said, I will make you a father of many nations. So... We see Abraham take that promise from God and begin this journey to a, a, a country or a land that he didn't know that God was going to show him. Again, we see in Genesis chapter 15. At this point now, Abraham is beginning to get a bit anxious. So he, there's a conversation with God. He says to God, I, I am old. I am getting old. You have not given me this son that you promised me. It is a, a slave born in my house that is the heir to all of these blessings. All of these things that you prospered me and blessed me. I don't, I am not happy that this son had not come. So he had that conversation with God. And God took him out, brought him out of his house in the middle of the night. And asked him to look in the, in the sky. And he looked up and he saw the stars. God says count them. He tried to count them. And he couldn't count them. He said count all the stars you see. He tried to count them. He couldn't. God says that's how you are going to have children. They're going to be as the stars of the heaven. And the Bible says when, they, when Abraham came back from that experience. Back into his tent. Bible says that he believed God. And he was counted to him for righteousness. So, so we see faith burn in his heart after that experience. It takes, it takes a while and, you know, this baby is not coming. Then his wife gets an idea one morning. <laughs> his wife says, I'm not understanding what is going on. Did God say that this child must come through me? We have 
this helper we got in Egypt who is living in our house. Why don't you take her to the bedroom and let's, let's have this baby through her. This baby doesn't have to come through me. For whatever the reason was, Abraham agreed to this plan. And they executed their plan and Ishmael was conceived. And after Ishmael was conceived, trouble broke out in the house. Now, the helper who is supposed to clean the house is not cleaning the house, he's sitting there. And then the madam says, what, what are you sitting and doing? He says, why are you talking to me like that? <laughs> why are you talking to me like that? I think you should go into the kitchen and make me some food. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and, and Sarah felt very insulted by Hagar and we know the story, and he treated her very harshly, and Hagar ran out of the house. Eventually, this baby was born. And when the baby was born, Abraham said to God that Ishmael may live. I am okay with you know, Ishmael. He's my child. It's okay. Can we walk with Ishmael? Forget about this, this other plan that you have. God says, uh-uh. <laughs> Ishmael is your plan. My plan is Isaac. And God insists that Ishmael be sent away. Now, the Bible says, when God made this promise to Abraham that he staggered not. So, what was going on? Let's look at the odds that were there. They are, they are old. At this time, Isaac was, uh, sorry, Abraham was 99 years old. He's an old man, his wife is old. That's number two. So first one, Abraham is old. Second one, his wife is old. Third one, his wife is barren. So when they were young, the baby didn't come. Now they are old. So you can see the weight of the promise of God was so heavy. It's the type that, you know, when they put a heavy weight on you, you stagger. And it was heavy because the odds against that promise coming to pass was huge. But something about Abraham, and that's what the Lord wants us to look at today. Something about Abraham, Bible says he refused to stagger. He did not stagger at the promise of God. So, so in other words, if the promise of God was a, a weight, when God threw it at Abraham and said, you will have a child, Abraham caught that weight and held. Hallelujah. Abraham caught that weight and held. What has God promised you that you are struggling to catch that weight and hold? If you stagger regarding the promise of God, it will not come to pass. Hallelujah. The enemy wants you to stagger. And you know, there are Promises that God has made to the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And the church is struggling and staggering to hold to that promise. Oh, yes. There are realities that we see in scriptures that are supposed to be our reality. But the church has been struggling and staggering, staggering, staggering. And that is why it has not come to pass. Well, I came this morning to announce that there's a new generation that God is raising who will believe and hold that promise and stagger not at the promise of God. There comes a time in your life when you need a change, an upgrade. You need upliftment. You need lasting results. You just want your life to be real. You need your life to be meaningful, deep, full, purposeful and easy. You're looking for enlargement, amplification, increase, strengthening. You're looking for growth in your life. You want leverage, strategic advantage, gain and favor, ability to influence, clout and strength. Join us at Resurrection Life Church every Sunday. Visit our website reslife.org.za for more information. Make this year your year of being real. Embrace rapid enlargement and leverage. It is your time.